thank Yaroslaw again for inviting me to come give a talk. Um, it's very fitting because our career paths have sort of are interconnected by the L7 gene, so it's really nice to uh, be able to meet you for, for, for once. And I want to thank you for making the L7 gene even more famous <laughs> than it already was. That's great. Um, let me just say, so the L7 gene, was, I first identified that gene as a graduate student at Columbia and was working with Cyrus Leventhal, who was sort of a computer modeler. Half the lab worked on protein uh, folding and three-dimensional structures of protein, and then the other half of the lab worked on reconstructing the zebrafish brain, and, try, and he was trying to map axons using, using isogenic organisms. They were all identical genetically, or cloned. Uh, females could be part of the genetically cloned. So his dream was to prove uh, basically, Sperry's hypothesis about axonal pathfinding. And so as a first stab into that foray, and since molecular biology was becoming, uh, uh, tools were becoming very strong, he decided, since it was very well known that the cerebellum had a very precise axonal input, uh, uh, inputs that were targeted to discrete regions of the cerebellum, he thought, that, and the fact that there were a host of genetic models uh, where certain spontaneous mutations had occurred in various facilities, and there was all this genetic uh, information from mouse mutants that applied directly to cerebellum. So that's why he wanted to focus on identifying markers of Purkinje cells that might reveal some markers that could serve as address cues that would bring in the axons. That was his overall. So I don't think we ever got to the point of proving or not Sperry's hypothesis but that was sort of the origin of this whole thing. We used a simple plus minus screen uh, using one of these mutants that's missing Purkinje cells. And so we did a cDNA library and, and screened for clones that were expressed using expressed in wild types, but not expressed in a lurcher mutant, which is missing Purkinje cells. And so one of the clones that came up was L7, which stands for Leventhal Clone 7. <laughs> It's also called, now called the PCP2 gene, or Purkinje cell protein 2, which Harry Orr gave the name because his lab cloned the gene simultaneously with mine. So anyway, as a postdoc, I went on cloned the promoter. We were able to show that the promoter linked to a coding sequence of a neutral protein like beta-galactosidase to drive expression in uh, Purkinje cells very specifically. And retinal bipolar neurons is the only other cell type that expresses this gene, period. You do RT-PCR of every other area of the brain, no expression at all that can be detected at any point during development so far, uh, and no uh, non-neuronal tissues. So Chris and I collaborated sometime in the 90s, uh, expressing using the promoter to express PKC inhibitor, uh, and many other people have used Yaroslaw's uh, 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 mouse, the L7-Cree, so it's almost exponential growth from the original time of identifying this gene. So I think it's fitting, so, this is, so is this gene just a promoter that can be used to, to, to target expression? So I think it's fitting to, to have been trying to figure out for some time what does this protein do. It's a very curious gene. The gene turned out to be very small. It's only about 2 kb from the promoter to the 3 prime end. So that made it really easy to work with in terms of a promoter uh, to, to target expression. And the protein itself, uh, is only, there's actually two transcriptional starts uh, in the cerebellum, actually, uh, yeah, in the cerebellum, and that produces two different proteins, 120 amino acid and a 99 amino acid. We don't know the functional difference between those two proteins, but it's a very small protein, very specifically expressed in Purkinje cells. So what I want to say today is that it doesn't appear, so we've got the knockouts from uh, Jim Morgan, who's currently at St. Jude in Memphis, and uh, they were in 129 originally, and we actually took some time and crossed them into C57 Black 6 at least 20 generations. By, na by uh, now, they're almost well over 40 to 50 generations in C57 Black 6. So all the data I'm going to talk about today uh, is in pure C57 Black 6 background. But what I want to say is that it doesn't appear in the knockouts. They have no motor defect. And, and in fact, in one assay, they actually do better on a motor learning assay. Um, and so we took that a little further, and it seems that the main realm of action of this protein is in a non-motor 
and emotional behaviors. So that's what I want to talk about. So first, uh, I uh, so I just have a I have a, a video here of a classic mouse mutant called Staggler. Uh, if you could play this, so clearly this animal has a taxi. You see, it has trouble getting started. Once it gets started, it kind of wobbles back and forth. It has trouble writing itself. Uh, so. So classic ataxia. So this animal basically loses 80% of its Purkinje cells. It was first reported by Sidman in 1962. Uh, and now we know that the gene was cloned by Bruce Hamilton in the 90s. Uh, and we now know that the gene is ROR alpha, which is a transcription factor in the nuclear receptor superfamily. And it's an orphan nuclear receptor. Nuclear receptor. Nobody knows yet what the ligand is for this particular. So it's in the same family as estrogen receptor uh, and glucocorticoid receptor, et cetera, et cetera. But it's an orphan because no one knows what the ligand is. So it's, there's very good data now to, to, to suggest that this is an autism gene, both by Valerie Hughes' lab and by Joe Buxbaum, who's done the human genetics, and this gene comes up in some of his, I have a slide later on to show this. So in an unbiased screen for, of more, almost 4,000 autistic humans, and, and more than, uh, almost double that in terms of controls, uh, this gene comes up uh, uh, in a human autism screen. Uh, and Valerie Hugh has gone on to show that this gene, that the, this, that the transcription of ROR alpha is regulated by, regulated oppositely by sex hormones. It's, a, it's activated by estrogen and it's inhibited by testosterone. So somehow this whole pathway is linked uh, by sex hormones. Okay, uh, and I'll come back to that. So, so I first want to just talk, so, so clearly one of the other points I wanted to make about this, so this is an autism gene, and yet the animal, the complete knockout of this gene causes ataxia. Ataxia is not a particularly autistic phenotype, right? So one can imagine that the variants in humans that would have any relevant to autism would be probably not knockouts, but some other variants that would affect either the regulation of its expression or the timing of its expression, something like that. Um, so that's typical of, of these kinds of genes. But, and the other thing is that ROR alpha is not just expressed in Purkinje cells. Certainly, this gene is very highly expressed in Purkinje cells, but it's also extremely highly expressed in the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and plays a role in circadian rhythms. Uh, it's also expressed highly in the, in the thalamus and in the cortex. And it's also expressed in bone, and these animals have sort of thinner and more brittle bones. And so Bruce Hamilton has done the targetome cloning, identified the target genes, the network of genes uh, uh, of this ROR alpha, and what he identified was a large calcium uh, related, one of the modules that he identified was calcium gene related, and PCP2, the gene, the uh, PL7 gene. Uh, so, so that's part, so, that, so there's some evidence from Bruce Hamilton's work to suggest that PCP2 or L7 is a, is a direct uh, target of ROR alpha. Okay, so I'll come back to that point. But clearly, the phenotype of the Dagmar mutant is not autism, it's, it's ataxia. So, so in terms of non-motor functions of the cerebellum, uh, I just want to quickly go through this. So, so, uh, so cerebellum, clearly motor learning, that, clearly that's motor, but it's sort of motor and beyond, because the cerebellum is not just con uh, controlling motor coordination, but certain kinds of learning occur in the cerebellum as well. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that the cerebellum plays some role in cognition and emotion. For example, uh, the so-called Schmeyman syndrome, which is in humans, there, there are many instances where a lesion to the cerebellum results not in motor defects, but in, in variations in emotion. So, particularly defects in, effect, in executive function, personality changes, language defects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so we've published many papers about this, and apparently the emotional cerebellum seems to be restricted, relatively restricted, to these more lateral regions of lobules 6 and 7. Uh, and that's what this figure indicates here, from a paper by Manto and Marion. Mar Mar 
other, other pieces of evidence. So the cerebellum is involved in tone cued fear memory in rodents, uh, and, and Sachetti has published some papers on this. Uh, and studies in non human primates have shown polysynaptic and reciprocal connections between the prefrontal cortex and the cerebellum. So he uses rabies virus uh, to do multi synapse pathway tracing, and has shown uh, these linkages between the cerebellum and the PFC. So, so, and then lastly, I just want to mention sensory function as well of the cerebellum. Uh, and clearly, in terms of motor behavior, sensory and motor, uh, sensory input, the coordination of sensory input and motor output is clearly a main function. But what I want to uh, suggest here as well from the work of, for example, of Daniel Wolpert, is that the cerebellum has a sensory filtering kind of function as well, which is partly a role that's applied during movements. It's actually a suppression of self-generated sensory stimuli. So the cerebellum has a way of predicting what self-generated stimuli are and of sending a signal to the motor cortex that erases that prediction. So the cerebellum has an intrinsic system for filtering out sensory information that, it, that, it, that, the, that, they, that by experience, the animal knows uh, is going to be caused by the action of the movement itself, self-generated. So you can imagine that if there's some perturbation of that ability to filter out that, then there could be a misperception, perhaps, of sensory stimuli, their size, or a change in how you respond to sensory stimuli. Okay, so I'm come back, because that could, that could, in fact, affect these more emotional aspects of cerebellar function. Um, so cerebellum and autism, so there's been lots of studies, particularly by Eric Corshane at UCSD, the cerebellum is hypomorphic in autism. There are many, many studies suggesting that, particularly in the vermis. Um, the connectivity of, of sensorimotor and language portions of the brain with the limbic emotional portion has been shown to be disrupted in autism. There's a nice paper in 2012 from Alex Martin at NIMH showing this, and the cerebellum was included in this sensorimotor region. So it was interesting because in this paper, it shows the complexity of the many regions that contribute to autism, which is paralleled by the huge number of genes that have been shown to be, to be uh, uh, susceptibility genes for autism. So clearly a very complicated and complex disease, autism, but it seems that there's good evidence that the cerebellum is playing a role from, based on imaging. And lastly, we heard Chris talk yesterday about the knockout, uh, the cell, Purkinje cell specific knockout of shank 2, uh, which shows repetitive behaviors and social behavior deficits. I think this is very good evidence of a non motor aspect to the to Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. So what is autism again? Just quickly. So these are the clear. These are these are the, the core symptoms: social behavior deficits, poor reciprocal interaction, lack of empathy, et cetera, et cetera. Communication defects, in particular, inability to read subtleties of language, for example, sarcasm, that kind of thing. And then repetitive behaviors or restricted in, in interests. But there are also sort of non-core uh, 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 behaviors related to sensory issues, for example, hypersensitivity to loud noises, that kind of thing. And frequently, these hypersensitivities to noises result in some kind of emotional meltdown that results in sort of an anxiety or panic kind of response. Right. So again, sort of tying into this idea that pretend, perhaps this aspect of a potential uh, cerebellar function in sensory modulation could tie in as well. Uh, so, so what about the cerebellum and autism? What would be, so, so clearly uh, you knock out it. most critical genes that are important for cerebellum development typically result in ataxia uh, when you knock them out. So that's not really autism. Uh, however, it is possible that a cerebellar defect may interfere with speech and contribute to communicative dysfunction, either at the level of motor function, since there are many muscles that coordinate speech, the diaphragm, the tongue, the facial muscles, etc., etc. So if those all have to be coordinated and, and inter interact with cognition, there could be sort of both motor aspects to this as well as cognitive aspects. So, so communication dysfunction. 
Uh, the cerebellum may also be involved in non-core sensory problems, which could tie into sensory overload and emotional meltdown, often observed in autism. And then I had always, before hearing Chris's talk, and I hadn't seen his paper before, I'd always thought, well, repetitive, how would the cerebellum tie into repetitive behaviors? I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but it seems that that is another area in which one could argue now that there's data to actually support it, uh, that repetitive behaviors as well. So lastly, I just want to, on this, in terms of non-motor functions of the cerebellum, there was another paper that came out in 2012 from Edith London's lab at UCLA, uh, showing that cerebellum uh, plays, using PET imaging, uh, at least adds some credence to the notion that the cerebellum may play a hormone-dependent, mood-modulating function. And this is a disorder. She did imaging of controls and women that had this PMDD, a very severe premenstrual uh, 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 syndrome. And what she showed is that certain specific regions of the cerebellum showed increased activity that was specific to PM, PMDD, and it, was, and it was specific to the late luteal phase. Right. So it's somehow hormone directed, and it somehow correlates with worsening of mood. So I just want to throw that in as a backdrop to this idea of, of hormonal potential hormonal interactions controlling some function of the cerebellum. Okay. So the genetics of emotion is uh, of the emotional cerebellum is a bit difficult to study, and I've already indicated why some of that is. So inactivation of important cerebellar genes like ROR alpha results in ataxia, which makes it difficult to assess any kinds of behaviors that rely on mobility, for example, social interaction, that kind of thing. If you're uh, gonna, gonna use a drunk person as a model for how humans interact socially, I mean, it's, it's somebody who's staggering around and can barely talk, uh, it's, it's not gonna be a good model and of, of general human behavior. Um, and so, same thing with uh, ataxic animal, it's gonna be hard to, to ease out. So you need to find other tricks. The other issue is that genes like ROR alpha are expressed in lots of different places. So you need to incorporate conditional targeting strategies like Chris talked about. Um, and lastly, the question is, should we expect some special molecular mechanisms that may uniquely subserve the emotional cerebellum? And I think today, I think that we, the, P, the PCP2 gene may be in such a pathway. Um, or alternatively, alternatively should, should mechanisms that are common to many cerebellar functions play a role in emotion, but in emotion-specific areas? So probably both of these things are true, um, but there may be some unique molecular pathways that are particularly important for, less so for motor behavior, but more so for the sensory filtering or other aspects that might affect emotion. So, L7G, finally getting to the actual point of the talk. Um, so, so the gene is only expressed in cerebellar Purkinje cells, and it's expressed in all Purkinje cells. It's not expressed just in the hemispheres and in lobules six and seven, in the emotional, so-called emotional cerebellum. It's expressed in all Purkinje cells, as far as we can tell. It encodes what's called a GoLoGo domain protein. That is to say, it's a very specific modulator of G-protein coupled receptors that, that signal through the G-alpha-I and G-alpha-O pathway. This is pertussis toxin-sensitive GPCRs. So that limits the potential interacting partners of the PCP, the L7 gene uh, in the cerebellum, and in particular, particularly the 5-HT1B uh, uh, serotonin receptor is heavily expressed in Purkinje cells and signals through this, uh, the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, there is, as we'll see, there is a, a, an estrogen, a surface-bound estrogen receptor, that's a GPCR, that also signals through, through G-alpha-I, G-alpha-O. Uh, and then there's probably a handful of other, potentially GABA-B receptor subtypes might signal through, through this. Um, so it at least limits who the partners could be, and I want to get at, at the end, uh, possible, uh, a possible mechanism here. So it's also, as I already mentioned, a transcriptional target of ROR alpha uh, in the nuclear receptor superfamily, as I already showed. So you can see here the exquisite specificity. This is just an antibody staining of a whole brain, showing only the cerebellum Purkinje cells. And here's Calvindin showing also Purkinje cells, but lots of other. And the promoter can be used to target protein expression to this, the cerebellum Purkinje cells. Right? It's using the L7 promoter to target GFP. 
So the knockouts, the first thing we observed after using, had to do about, I, I believe the number was eight mutants of both sexes, eight of females, eight males uh, of wild types versus knockouts. Uh, and we were able to identify, again, this is a pure C57 black 6 background. There's a very subtle decrease in the overall size of the cerebellum, and it's all been quantitated here, and, it's, and this is published. Uh, and what we found was that the cerebellum, the Purkinje cell soma, is about 15% uh, reduced in size. The Purkinje cell bodies are a little more densely placed, and the dendritic layer, the molecular layer, is a little bit thinner than, uh, than the normal. So those are, all, those are all things that contribute to the overall decrease in size of the cerebellum, uh, but there's no effect on lamination. Everything looks perfectly normal other than that. Okay. So this is sort of the opposite of the P10 mutant, where, where when you knock it out, you get an increased soma size. Uh, and the same thing with tuberous sclerosis. This is sort of the opposite of that. Um, the, everything, the lamination, everything seems normal, but everything is reduced in size. Could suggest some opposite effect on the AKT pathway, which P10 signals through, uh, but you know that's all speculation. We don't have any data to support that. So behavior. Uh, so so the first thing I want to say is so all the rotor rod data was done directly in in my animal space and in my uh, facility, and so this was all done during during the, the light part of the day, this rotorod data that I'm going to talk about. All the other data I'm going to talk about were done in collaboration with Randy Nelson, and so all of the other data were done in the animal's active time or their night time under red light conditions. This experiment was not. That's the only difference between uh, all the... So this was the original lead-in data that we published, and what it showed was that, so these are animals that are just recently weaned, pretty much, uh, adolescents from about four to five weeks old. So both males and female mutants on a rotor rod learning paradigm, three trials per day, an accelerating rotor rod, and then given, trained over seven days, essentially. And what you see is all animals improve over this time, wild types and mutants, but the mutants of both sexes do better than the, the wild types. And then if you go to mature animals, uh, 12 weeks old in, on average, uh, what you find is that the males, the males actually reduce inactivity. They get, males get much heavier and fatter than the females, and they tend to do less well overall on the rotor rod, but they show this nice, they retain this improved. Uh, whereas the females, there's not much of it, and if anything, there are, the female mutants do a little bit worse, but it's not significantly different from the wild types at this older age. So one of the things that we noticed was that it, it actually physically, if you watch these animals perform on the rotor rod, it looked, especially the males, they actually looked like they were enjoying it. You can kind of, if you really watched enough of these animals over time, uh, they didn't fight, they didn't struggle to get on that rotor rod, they just wanted to get on, they wanted to run. That's what it seemed like. And so that led us to start thinking, well, is this, a, this is not a really good, this is not a really good assay for learning, per se. Uh, uh, we, there are better assays for cerebellar-related motor learning. So I think somebody like Chris needs to do some experiments uh, uh, related to this to get at motor learning. But the question was, could this be an, a, a measurement of affect rather than uh, rather than a motor uh, effect, right? And so that's why we started to work with Randy Nelson, who has a lot of experience studying uh, emotional behaviors and anxiety and things and sexual dimorphism, that kind of thing. He's at Ohio State. And we started to look at a broader spectrum of behaviors. And so one of the things that, so this was for a swim test. And, and again, what, what came out of this, so this is a direct parallel to this experiment, because it shows a very similar uh, effect on the male mutants. The males swim a little bit more, significantly more than the male mutants than the, the wild types, whereas very little effect on this assay, meaning that they're, they have a more, maybe perhaps a more optimistic, the mutants have a more optimistic view. They don't give up on the swimming, they swim longer. Okay, so that's kind of consistent with this data. So then we, we did a much larger study on open field. Uh, uh, this is in the dark, this, these studies. 
an open field behavior, under red light. And essentially what we found, we did two cohorts of animals, but well spaced in time, so completely non-overlapping cohorts, about at least a year or so separated in time. Uh, both co cohorts showed exactly the same effect, and then we combined the cohorts for this particular analysis, and we included cohort as one of, in, in ANOVA as a variable, and we could show no cohort effect, that is, the, the, the effects were not significantly different between these two cohorts, so we pooled the data, and that's what's shown here, and this is the total number of animals that went into this analysis. And I should say, Carl Schilling helped with, uh, I'll cite him at the end, but he helped with a lot of the statistical analysis of this data. So essentially what we saw was really no effect on males. Uh, uh, in terms of total exploratory activity, we, we recapitulated what other labs, for the, the uh, Don Fox lab uh, at Rockefeller, uh, et cetera, had shown females normally have much, explore more in the open field than males do. We recapitulated that, but what we showed was that the knockout females had this reduction in exploratory activity. Same thing with vertical rearing. They have much less vertical rear, well, significantly less vertical rearing than uh, the wild type females. But it's female specific. However, when you look at the ratio of time spent in the center versus the periphery, that's a measure of anxiety. Uh, what we found was that the males have a significant increase in the time spent in the center. That is reduced anxiety in the center of the open field. Whereas the females have increased anxiety. Spend le female mutants spend less time in the center of the periphery. And there's a very significant gene-sex interaction here. And it's clear why that is, because they actually, the genotype oppositely affects the, the, the two sexes. Um, and then, so this, these, two pan, these three panels were published. Then we did a, a third, a, another experiment, but it's very, we only have six, uh, a total N of six males uh, of mutants, three males, so this is really not publishable. But on elevated plus maze, the, the, so far with the limited data that we have, it sort of suggests the same thing. On the elevated plus maze, the time in the open arms, the male mutants spend significantly more time on the open arms with an N of three mutants. Uh, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, and, pro and no significant difference, although there is a reduction in the females, which one would expect based on this data. But again, not publishable. So, so I just want to point out, so there have been previous studies from other labs looking at the, the effect of sex hormones on open field activity. This is a developmental study showing the effect of, of prenatal exposure to testosterone on exploratory activity, showing that, that fetal exposure to testosterone basically masculine, masculinizes the females so that they have an exploratory activity that's more like males. This is in adults, right, but that were exposed prenatally to testosterone. And then the, the, a, a parallel experiment in adults from the FAF lab uh, did over you looked at overectomized females with and without estrogen, showing that estrogen uh, uh, re increases anxiety in the open field and reduces time and center of the open field. Right. So based on this, it's possible to suggest a general idea. For example, again, this is there's no evidence to support this, but but on the face of it, it was, it's potentially possible that what PCP2 is doing is acting as a damper on sex hormone <coughs> functions. Again, we'd have to prove this. Where, where it's normally, it's normally it's essentially damping down an, a, a, an effect of estrogen that would tend to increase anxiety. And when you remove L7, you have that increased anxiety because estrogen is having a bigger effect. If I were gonna do an experiment now, what I would wanna do is actually do overectomy of wild types and L7 mutants and then expose both of them to estrogen. And what I would expect to see would be maybe a bigger effect of estrogen in the knockouts. Unless this was a developmental effect and there's no way to change it, uh, there, there may, it, it may or may not work, but I think it would be a good experiment to do. Uh, and then in males, perhaps what it's doing is damping down some function that normally, uh, normally increase, or decreases anxiety, right? I don't know what that function would be. It could be testosterone, but I don't know. 
And then when you remove L7, they have, in fact, decreased anxiety. Uh, so, so again, that's sort of, we'll just throw out the notion, perhaps, that L7 acts as a damper on hormonally driven uh, uh, behaviors, or hormonally regulated. So this is not much to write about here. We did fear conditioning. There was no clear-cut effect on learning. Of, so basically, we gave them eight-tone uh, shock trials. Uh, and this is just the acquisition data. Well, what was interesting in the acquisition this is males, this is females. The white lines, uh, the white symbols, are the knockouts. And again, what you can see again, it's very subtle in this case. Uh, but there's a very significant genotype, sex, trial, three-way interaction, right? So essentially, and again, it's very similar in, in direction to the previous data. The males overall have a slightly less, uh, 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 slightly lower amplitude of freezing activity, whereas the females have a slightly increased amplitude of freezing activity, right, over time. And so essentially, this ends up in being a significant, a significant difference that sex, that genotype and trial events, so curve shape, is significantly different across these two sexes. So something about the dynamics of acquisition. Um, we also looked at, uh, we did eight uh, trials for memory. And again, this is, even over those eight trials, even though it's, it, we, there is actually a little bit of extinction, extinction that's going on. Normally, when you do extinction, you do, what, 50 or 100? trials, that kind of thing. So there is some extinction evidence here. And then overall, as a, group, as a whole, this data for the memory part really only shows a genotype trial interaction. So again, in, in the end, it's pretty much just a, a very subtle effect. Doesn't seem to affect memory, although again, if you look at the averages of these eight trials, you can see again that in the male, so there's a slight uh, reduction in the amplitude of the, of the freezing response that's learned. This is the long-term memory, 24 hours after the training. You can see there's a slight reduction and then there's a slight increase in the females in terms of the amplitude of the freezing response. But it's not significant, uh, that difference. All right, so again, not, not much to write home about, but again, it's consistent in the sense that there's this opposite effect, this genotype sex, in this case, genotype sex trial interaction. It's in the same direction as the previous data. So the last behavioral data that I have is social behavior. Uh, and that's what's shown here. So we did the standard three-chamber social choice test. The first part of the test is a sociability test, where you have a mouse on one side and just the, an empty cage on the other side. And you just measure how much time does the mouse spend sniffing this cup that has a, a mouse in it. Uh, how much time does it spend in the neutral space, and how much time does it spend interacting or sniffing this inanimate object? And then the second part of the test is to compare the, the is to is to measure the amount of interaction of this test mouse with a familiar mouse, the one he already met the first time, versus a stranger who he's just now meeting for the first time. And a normal mouse will spend more time investigating the stranger than the familiar mouse. So in terms of sociability, the first step, uh, the, the L7 mutants, so we basically in this data, we did the standard way that these experiments are typically using the parametric statistical test to, uh, to, uh, to look at the data. And essentially we found both, uh, in both the males and the females, they still had, they, they had, both had, just like the wild types, had a significant preference for the mouse versus the inanimate object. Okay? So there's still a preference. It's the sociability seems relatively normal. In the social, in the preference for social novelty, the choice of, between a stranger and a familiar mouse, however, was a little bit different. Uh, in that case, the wild types, uh, females and males, show a significant preference for the stranger, which is what you would expect. But you lose the significance. There's a slight reduction uh, in the females and the males uh, in terms of how much time they spend interacting with uh, the, the stranger. But there's no genotype effect. It's not significant. So Carl Schilling, though, looked at this data. And what he realized, or what he 
suspect is this is a this is a data set that's probably more appropriately analyzed by a statistical test that's called compositional analysis. That is, this is a typical test where an animal is in, a, in, a, in an arena for a fixed time, five minutes in this case, and it's spending its time making some choices. And it's, it, when it, cho and it's, it can choose to sniff this mouse, it can choose to sniff this object, or it can spend most of its time not sniffing in or, or at all, right? And in this kind of analysis, you basically don't even look at the time spent not sniffing, right? You totally basically throw out that data. In addition, the time that the mouse spends interacting with this mouse uh, is related to the time, probably inversely, to the time that it spends. Uh, so these variables are not independent, right? And so what, what Carl did was do, do reanalyze re this data using a statistical test that's frequently used in geology where you're measuring ratios. So this time is really a ratio out of five minutes. How much time does it spend sniffing this animal versus the object, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So there are statistical tools to handle that. And so this is the, the reanalyzed data using compositional analysis, and I think Carl's going to talk about this in his talk. So essentially what, what was observed, again, it's very subtle, but here's the wild type, this is an associability test, right? Uh, so the males are in blue, the females are in red. And this, essentially what we observed, both in the sociability test and the preference for social novelty, is better discrimination in the mutants of a, of a sex difference between these, between these animals. Here you can see these, these, these circles here are the 95% confidence intervals of these data. So two things happen in the mutant, particularly in the preference for social novelty test. You have less scatter in the, in the data, right? The, 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 the diameter of these circles is smaller. And in addition, you can see that the females tend to spend more time not sniffing. So in this preference for social novelty test, using this compositional analysis, you can actually extract <coughs> sociability data out of this social novelty data. Right, and you're not, you're not, so you're not actually eliminating that data. You're actually incorporating it and statistically analyzing that third component, which is not sniffing, the time spent not sniffing. Right, and so again, what I would like to suggest is that is that, that this is not a genotype, a significant genotype effect, but what it suggests is a significant genotype sex interaction once again. Right, um, and so that's the main point I wanted to make with this data. So, so that's sort of the, considering the previous talk with all the variabilities that can affect, the one consistent theme in all of these tests is this genotype sex interaction. All right, so that's, that's the main take home. Um, and I, is my time pretty much done? Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let me, just, let me just finish. So the, 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 the basic idea, we did a lot of experiments as well uh, with, um, the, with, with some of the more, uh, 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 molecular functions of the PCP2 gene. In particular, we used a reduced system, the Xenopus oocyte system, to reconstitute the P-type calcium channel, which is the tottering calcium channel. The channel is mutated in the tottering mutant. And that's the, 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 the functional subunit, uh, the, alpha, the alpha subunit is the CAC -NA, uh, NA1A gene. I think Chris talked about that a little bit yesterday. But what we were able to do, we, use, we inject into, these, into the Xenopus oocytes, we inject all three of the subunits that make up this channel. And you can functionally record the channel on the surface of using patch clamping. You can record this, the, the, the functional channel. Um, and what we did was we co-injected uh, an RNA for the kappa opioid receptor because it's been well established these voltage-gated calcium channels are negatively modulated by uh, GI, by receptors that signal through GIGO, right? And then kappa opioid receptor, receptor is a classic one that signals through GIGO. So we co-injected RNAs for that receptor, and then we co-injected in combination with and without the L7 protein. What we found was that the L7 protein modulates the effect of the GPCR on the calcium channel. So it's a little bit complicated, but L7 is a modulator of that inhibitory action of the kappa opioid receptor on the, on the voltage-dependent calcium channel. 
And then what was interesting is it fights bidirectional. At low concentrations of L7, you got an enhancement of that inhibition. Right? This is measuring the calcium channel activity with and without L7, right? L7 versus control ratio. So we see an enhanced inhibition at low concentrations, and we found that that was G beta gamma dependent, and you can test that using the beta, uh, the, the C terminal of the bark, it's called. You can test that because that blocks C, uh, the G beta gamma. And you can also do a pre-pulse paradigm which releases G beta, G, G beta gamma. So we can show that this was G beta gamma dependent at low concentrations, and that's because L7, when it binds to the alpha subunit, it binds to the GDP form, prevents the GDP from being, uh, being released from the alpha subunit and keeps it inactive. And it also prevents the beta gamma subunit from reassociating with the alpha. That's what the function of the GoLoco domain proteins is. They act as GDIs uh, and prevent further cycling of, the G of that receptor. So at low concentrations, that ends up resulting in a, in, in a local enhancement of G beta gamma, free G beta gamma levels, which can act to, to, in, to inhibit the calcium channel. But as you ramp up the L7, you basically take out of circulation all of the G-alpha subunits, keep them inactive, and you prevent them from reassociating with beta-gamma. So you essentially shut down the cycle. That's basically how, how it works, at least according to this in vitro data. We don't have any data in vivo in mice to support this model. But the bidirectionality, I'll just skip this because it's too complicated and come up with, this is sort of the model that we have uh, so, so here is the normal, this is G-alpha IO activation, so this would be neuromodulation, 5-HT. Uh, estrogen, there is this receptor called GPR30, uh, which, which according to the Allen Atlas is expressed in cerebellar Purkinje cells, and there's a paper that's been published to suggest this is not a nuclear receptor that binds estrogen, this is actually a surface receptor on the cell surface which mediates very rapid changes of estrogen on the cell, and particularly, and not in Purkinje cells has been shown, but in other neurons, uh, this receptor can, can stimulate calcium signaling within the cell, calcium release intracellularly. So this is a potential, so 5-HT, alpha-2 adrenergic, et cetera, all of these receptors, L7 essentially changes at, uh, at low concentrations, it's, it basically enhances the effect of the receptor, that's the idea. And then at high L7 con concentrations, one would expect to eliminate uh, variability due to hormonal or G protein coupled receptors. You would essentially decouple the system so it would be insensitive to hormonal effects. That would be the model, hormonal or whatever, serotonin. Um, so anyway, that's the general idea. Whether this, I, I've sort of thrown it out there just to be controversial, L7 is a, is a potentially a mood regulator the data is not really, I don't really have any data to really support that it has a mood function. Mood is a little bit different from emotion. But, it, but, it's, but in essence, uh, I, I think it's, it's at least, uh, in terms of a molecular mechanism that could have such a function, it seems almost perfect. And in addition, it sort of ties in potentially, it's been known for a long time that there's this robust serotonergic innervation to the cerebellum and the alpha-2 adrenergic innervation. So perhaps this is a link to the, the, to the roles of those. I don't know how much data is out there showing what the role of serotonin input is to the cerebellum, but this sort of uh, uh, effects on emotional control could be an attractive model for looking at what the function of those in, in input systems are to the cerebellum, a, a neuromodulatory function. And I'm just going to finish we, uh, this again as the data from Buxbaum showing this ROR alpha. Uh, we found four modules in humans of genes that are involved in, um, in autism. And in the, in the transcriptional module, uh, ROR alpha, MECP2, and P10 show up. So P10 and MECP2 are, have both been shown. So Rett syndrome, and then this is the, the P10, Hamartoma syndrome, which has phenotypes of autism. Uh, so, so anyway, so the basic, in the future, what we, what we need to really know is, what I would like to know is, what, does L7 play any role in motor learning? That's sort of a, an important, we've only looked at very crude tools to look at motor function, but what, 
effect could it have on motor learning? I think we need to do that, like in VOR or I believe conditioning. I would predict that it's probably not going to affect learning per se, but possibly the amplitude of the, of the, of the learning and particularly of the acquisition and possibly extinction. Um, we know that motor learning uh, is in the cerebellum is sex hormone dependent. And Chris's, Chris's lab has published some work on that. Is there's an estrogen dependence. Estrogen enhances uh, cerebellar motor learning. Uh, and lastly, we would like to know what are the, the what, what is the mechanism for this sex dimorphic effect. We know, so what I told you about the function, the in vitro function, where low levels of L7 do one thing and high levels do another, we know that if we look at Western blots, in males and female mice, there's no difference in the level of the total protein. So it's not a simple, uh, the bidirectional effect of the mutation on mice has nothing to do with the level of the protein expressed in males versus females. So that's sort of a disappointment. It would have been nice if there was an easy correlation uh, between the level of the protein. But one of the things I didn't have a chance to talk about is this fact. The L7 mRNA is abundantly translocated into the dendrites. So there could be local effects on protein synthesis that are different in the two sexes. That's a possibility. We just have no idea. Um, and then, the, then uh, it's possible that sex-specific factors may affect the intrinsic physiology of Purkinje cells as well. So that's another potential avenue. And then there's post-translational processing. There, the protein may be modified. There are plenty of three, serines and threonines in the L7 protein. They could be phosphorylated. There's all kinds of possibilities, plus the fact that there are multiple forms of the protein. We don't know if the L7A versus L7B has different functions uh, uh, in vivo or not. But and then that may be different in males and females. So there's a host of things that still need to be explored in this view. Uh, so that's pretty much it, and I'm sorry to go over time. So I just want to acknowledge Randy Nelson, who I already mentioned. Mike Zhu is the guy, he's currently, he used to be at OSU, but he's currently in Houston. He did the, the, the Xenopus O site recordings, uh, and Carl Schilling helped out with the, uh, the, with the statistical analyses. Uh, and James Walton was a graduate student that did a lot of the behavioral analysis. And all the tests were blinded as well. <laughs> we typically videotaped, and then a blinded person analyzes the videotape. And yeah. Okay, sorry to go over.